If you will turn with me to the book of Jonah, chapter 1. We're going to do chapter 2 today, but we're going to start in chapter 1. We left off, and, and I'm, I'm doing this intentionally. First week we did, we ended with, but God. The second week is the Lord had prepared. And as you're turning there, verse 17 of Jonah says, the Lord prepared, and what that meant is appointed or called, called to fulfill. It's not the first time a fish is going to be used. Um, well, let me rephrase that. It's the first time a fish is used, and Jesus will use a fish later. And throughout the Bible, God uses animals for His purposes to bring about lessons, everything from Balaam's donkey to a crow to a fish. We're going to find out later in chapter 4, a worm. And God is over all nature. And when we come to this part in Jonah, this is where most people have problems. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we get started. Uh, Father Michelle has shared from her heart how she has had a week. And she is not the only one. Uh, many of us have uh, felt like we've been run over and then backed up over. I even heard someone once say, Felt like they kicked life's dog and life was paying them back. And Father, there are times that we feel that way. And we don't know why. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Father, we and our country have been so blessed, more so than we can imagine, that when things don't go right, it's abnormal. And there's places in the world where that's a reality every day. Help us to remember how blessed we are to live in this country and not to take it for granted. And in our afflictions and our suffering and our trials and tribulations, I pray that you would help us to see you. So just help us during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verse 17 says, Now that the Lord prepared a fish a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and said, we'll stop right there. We're going to go through the whole chapter. But when we come to this story of Jonah and this great fish, we miss what's going on because all we focus on is he's in a great fish. Is that possible? Could that be? That's kind of ridiculous. And some people even look at this and go, yeah, this is just an, a story to help teach a lesson. It's not really real because if we can't understand it, then it must not be what? Real. And it's not just non-Christians that have issue with this story. There's a lot of Christians, if they're honest, that have trouble with this story. Matter of fact, the first time I heard somebody really come at me uh, with this story as an attack was a critic. And what I found out is most Christians I talked to had one or two responses. It was either, well, God created the world, He can do that. God raised the dead, He can do that. You just need to believe it by faith. But I was more a skeptic. I'm still very much a skeptic. I'm a doubting Thomas. I struggle with that. And a doubting Thomas needs more than, oh, just believe it's okay. And so this teacher was at, it was at VCU, and he was mocking Christians, and he used this story, which they do very often. I just saw Judy just went like this. But it's real, and they've got a good point. This is how the argument used to go. Do you really believe a woman turned into salt? Now the audience is all going, hmm, they're leaning in. Do you really believe a man swallowed by a whale? And so often these Christians, they go, yeah, I believe. Why? The Bible says so. Peter says we're to have a defense for everything we believe. And we can say the Bible says so, and then you can go, and, and add to it. This teacher got up, and he really nailed me. This is what he said, Pam. Does anybody here believe? Now, I was smart enough because I wanted to grade. I'm not going to stick my neck out because I know these, these teachers are baiting you. You might believe this story of a whale, and this poor little girl said, I do. He goes, do you know whales can't even swallow a watermelon less than a man? Do you know there's some whales that can't even swallow an orange? Their esophagus is so small they can't swallow it. Did you know that? And he just lit into her, and I was like, man, I'm glad she did it, not me. 
And this was before Google and the internet, so me and some friends went downstairs into the library and we began to look up, is that real? And you know what, the teacher was absolutely right. Whale's throats aren't very big. Some can't swallow an orange, some can't swallow a melon. But there is one that can swallow a tractor trailer. He left that one out, the sperm whale. And when I was growing up, we had uh, two men that came. I don't know if you remember this. I thought about this last night. We had two young men that came into our yard. We were outside, and they came around the corner, and he had a bag on his shoulder. And this was back in the day when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. They were going door-to-door -door selling encyclopedias. <laughs> and my mom bought them, and it was awesome. We really used those encyclopedias. They were the Google of our day. And, and we were looking that up. And if you ever had the Encyclopedia Britannica, they had something World Book didn't have, or at least we didn't know about. If you were looking something up in Encyclopedia Britannica and you couldn't find it, or it didn't have enough information, you could either call them or write them and they would send you reports. Extra material that would go with the Encyclopedia, which was an ingenious way of saving publishing money. I want to read you one of the reports that you could get from the Encyclopedia Britannica, just parts of it. And I normally don't read, but I want to read this morning. This is from, parts of this is from the Encyclopedia Britannica. The report theorized that the great fish was most likely a sperm whale. While the common Greenland whale could scarcely swallow an orange, the sperm whale had a mouth the average size of 20 feet long, 15 feet high, and 9 feet wide. That's the esophagus as well. It is well known that sperm whale feed largely on squid, giant squid, and of course, they're much larger than humans. As to whether a man could survive in a whale's stomach, the Britannica article maintained one certainly could, through, though through great discomfort. The report maintains it would be sufficient enough air to breathe because air was necessary in that part of the beast in order for it to float properly. The temperature inside the whale would be great, an unbearable 100 to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. It would be unpleasant to con uh, uh, there would be an unpleasant contact with the whale's gastric juices, but these juices could not have digested living material. You may be surprised to hear that Jonah is not even the only human ever to survive such an ordeal. During a voyage of a whaling ship in February of 1891, a sperm whale was spotted and pursued in the vicinity of the Falkland Islands. And in the attempt to harpoon a whale, one sailor drowned while a second one disappeared. Eventually, the whale was killed and drawn to the side of the ship where it was dissected. The next day, the stomach was hoisted on a deck and opened, and there was the missing sailor laying inside. He was unconscious but alive. He was eventually revived and after time resumed his duties on the board of the whaling vessel. Listen, Christian, you don't have to commit intellectual suicide to believe this story. There's a lot of stuff out there that makes you go, huh, good point. But there's a couple other reasons we should be believing this as, as Christians. One is because the Bible is trustworthy. Psalm 19 says the testimony of the Lord is sure. This isn't just a book put together by men with their opinions. We believe this is really God's revelation to man. But the biggest reason, in my opinion, to believe this story is because Jesus believed it. When Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees and they were asking him to perform a sign to prove to him that he was who he said he is, he said, no, sh no sign shall be given to you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so either Jesus was extremely naive, or worse yet, he was a liar. And we've already talked about there's extra biblical material that Jonah's a real person. So don't get caught up on the whale, because there's something even bigger going on here. We get caught up on the whale and we miss the prayer. This is the only prayer in your Bible recorded that was underwater. Just remember that next time you hear it, okay? And, and the first thing I want you to notice is Jonah's heart changes. And when it changes, there's a confession. Look with me, if you will. It says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me out of the belly, out of, the belly of Sheol. Some translations will have out of the belly of hell. I cried, and you heard my, vo my voice. Verse 3, 
Now listen to this. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. He cries out in his affliction, and if you read this chapter, he's in there three days before he prays. That's a hard-hearted prophet right there. He's saying, after everything's happened, day one, not talking to him. Day two, not talking to him. Day three, maybe I need to talk to him. And the reason is because God often uses affliction in our life to get our attention. And this is the sad thing. He doesn't have to, but often we make it that way. Do you remember when Paul was being persecuted and Jesus saw him on the, on the road and blinded him? I'm sorry, when Paul was persecuting and Jesus blinded him. Do you know God didn't get his attention right there? God had been trying to get his attention the whole time because he says, why do you keep kicking against the what? The Bible teaches that when God is disciplining us, there's a number of ways we can react to him. We can resist it, fight him on it. Uh, news for you, who will win? God will win. We can be discouraged by it and grow faint. We can resist it to the point he'll invite stronger discipline, or we can submit and endure it and grow by it. C.S. Lewis said, God often whispers in our pleasures, but he often shouts at us in our pain. And what he means by that is often it's the times of struggling and suffering that God slows us down enough to get our attention. I think he is talking to us all the time, but we are so distracted, so busy, so caught up, that when something comes into our life that is bigger than we can handle, that is when we stop and go, God. He uses that. He uses irritations in our life, and I believe he does that because, at least in my life, it's often at a point where I realize I have no power, I have no control, I have no options, I can't fix this. All that I am left with is God. Uh, my grandchild's teaching me a lot of lessons, and I know I use my family, but you need to remember something. My whole life is made up of two things, y'all and my family. I don't have a lot of outside life, so that's the only reason I use these illustrations. I can't use y'all because you'll get offended. So I use my family. But I've noticed something about Mia when she turns three. She wants to do everything by herself, and then she'll do something I know she can't do. And I used to try to use logic with her. Like a three-year-old understands that. Honey, you know, this is a little too complicated for you. Let me, let me do this for you and just get. And what I do now is I go, here you go. And eventually she will turn to me and go, Aggie, can you do this? We do the same thing. But we should know better. We will fight and kick and do what we want and obstinate and strong will and try to manipulate and do all that. And then when we realize we can't, then and only then do we go, I need what? Help. That's where Jonah is. And I don't know about you, oftentimes I need to realize that my problem solver isn't me, it's who? God. The problem is I don't what? Trust him too much. I put more trust in myself than I do in him. Just like Mia, she puts more trust in what she can do than in me. And what I do with her is I sit and wait, and then when she comes to me, what I do is I sit down with her, and I not only do it for her, but I explain to her how it's done. And what I'm doing is building trust and love and intimacy in a relationship, and that's what God wants. That's what he wants with Jonah. Now, here's the other thing I want you to remember. Where is he right now? He's in the fish. There is no iPhone. There's no flashlight he can turn to. What is it like? I want you to just picture this for a second. Y'all can do this. We'll do Bible study together this morning. What is it like in there? I just read it to you. It's hot and it's what? Dark. And as we read this, we also find out, I believe it's verse 4, where he feels God has forsaken him. I believe God has allowed this event, and I could be wrong. I'll ask Jonah when I get to heaven because he is in heaven. I believe 
he's giving Jonah a little taste of what the Ninevites will experience when they step off into eternity. They will be cast out in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And is it going to be hot? And I believe what God is doing is not only trying to build a relationship with him, but trying to help him to see from the Ninevites' point of view. And so what he's doing in this prayer is confessing. When you read this, I hope you go back and read it today. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Listen, that shows you something about God right there. He has run from God. He has not been a good representative of God. He has cost almost the life of other people because of his disobedience. And when he cries out to God, what does God do? Answers him. You know what we would have done? Yeah, you wallow a little bit. Because that's how we are. Aren't you glad God's not like us? It says, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Your billows and waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. Do we cast God off sometimes just like Jonah? I want you to think about this. God's been dealing with me. Is this. Do I miss witnessing opportunities because I worry about what people will think? Um, or worse yet, do I witness with my mouth but live it out so bad that people go hypocrite? Do I cast God off like Jonah? I don't want to, because what Jonah said is, I'm leaving you, God. And he doesn't cry out until he feels God has left him. Do I do that? Do I feel like I've done this, that I've messed up so big there's no hope? Has Jonah messed up big? Yeah. The mess that, that I've created, do you feel like God's abandoned you? Have you had such a week you're like, God, where are you? He confesses where he's at. The second point I want to share is his soul is restored. Look at the rest of verse 4. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The water surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed in around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. And I went down to the moorings of the mountains, to the very part of the deep, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you and into your holy temple. When Jonah runs from God, and how many of y'all have ever run from God? I've done it, have y'all? Somebody hurts us or something happens, we get angry at God, or God doesn't answer the prayer we want, we get angry at God, or God's not showing up, and we run from him. And I want you to notice this, Jonah, when he runs from God, goes down, 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 down. He went down to Joppa, down into the bottom of the boat, down into the sea, and now he's down in the fish's belly. And that is what happens when we run from God. And what we're going to find out in just a little bit is why that happens. And when one soul is restored to God... You can see it in a life because God brings that soul up. This prayer, I don't know if you've noticed this, you probably didn't, is filled with Bible. He refers to seven Psalms, a verse out of Lamentation, a verse out of the book of Job, and a verse out of Kings 1.8. This man knows his Bible and he's praying it. We read it and just go, wow, but it's, he's, he's praying Bible verses. And in this verse in Kings 1.8, he's talking about turning to the temple because it, and what Solomon said when he dedicated the temple was this, O oh Lord my God, and listen to the cry and prayer which your servant is praying before you today, that your eyes may be open toward this temple night and day, toward the place which you said my name shall be there, that you may hear my prayer which is from your servant as I make it toward this place. And may you hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place. He goes on and says, then you will hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to his own ways whose hearts you know, for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Jesus in our New Testament tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And when Jonah says, I'm praying toward the temple, that's what he's talking about. God, you said you would hear, so I'm praying to your temple. 
And the last thing I want to share as we come to the Lord's table this morning is this. For the first time, Jonah can see his problem. Let me read it to you. We'll just finish out the chapter. Verse 8. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay to you what I vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah's problem is not God, and it's not the Ninevites. Jonah's problem is Jonah. Do you know who your biggest problem is? It's not your wife, and it's not your husband. It's not your children. It's you. If you ask my wife, it's me. But really, it's, it's her. We are all broken, and we all have idols. This verse where it says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, the way this would be a Larry translation of that, those who turn from God and pursue other things to replace them are tying the noose around their neck. Let me explain that a little bit. An idol is something that replaces God. It's a God replacement. And we pour our devotion and our affection and our resources into it to go after it. And what we're pursuing is something that only God can give us. I was talking to a young man this morning and we were talking about the joy of the Lord and how the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if you ask anybody this, let's take a little test today. Do y'all want love in your life? Raise your hand. How about joy? How about peace? How about a little patience? Everybody, I don't, if, even if you talk to a new Christian and do it in a sneaky way, they will say, yes, I want all of those things. But the Bible says that is the fruit of the Spirit. Whose Spirit? God's spirit. We want love. We want peace. And those are things really that only God can give us, but we pursue that in different ways, and God calls that idols. So if I want love, I'll pursue a 20-year-old. I'll find it in the arms of a 20-year-old. Really? You're tying a noose around your neck. You're going to get in trouble. Will you find love there? Or will you find some pain? I want peace, and I believe peace through pharmaceutical use. Will you find peace? For a season. But on the other end of it, it's usually slavery. I want joy, so the best way to find joy is shopping on Amazon. And if you got Amazon Prime, you get two joys. When you buy it, and next day when you open the front door. But does that give you the joy you're looking for? All of that is very short-lived. Do you know what Jonah's idols are? His pride and his prejudice. No pun intended. Pride and prejudice. He is too proud to go. He wants to see them pay, and he doesn't like the Ninevites. And what God is doing is working in his life and showing him, Jonah, the problem you're having is you. And when he recognizes this and confesses it, I want you to notice something. He says, I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is the Lord. He's praising God. He's thankful. Now let me ask you a question. Has he been taken out of his situation? No. Is it still 104 degrees and nasty? Yes. Is it still dark? Yes. But when, you can, when God puts us in an affliction or in suffering, he has got us in his school, if we will let him, to produce something in us that he refers to as Christ-likeness. Even the Bible talks about with Jesus that he had to suffer many things in order to be brought into perfection. Did you know that's in your Bible? Do you know Paul suffered many things, and even prayed to God that God would remove the suffering from him. Did you know it's in there? If Jesus suffered and Paul suffered, what makes, what makes you think you're not going to? But here's the question. Let me read this. That was, this is what I was looking for. I cut some things out of the sermon today. Let me read this to you. For it was fitting for him, talking about Jesus, it was fitting for him for whom all things and for by whom all things are made, bringing many sons to glory to make him the captain of our salvation 
to perfect him through sufferings. That's Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. If Jesus suffered, then why do we get all worked up when we suffer? You want to know why? We're Americans. I was looking at some kids over in the Ukraine during our OCC training, and we watched a video with these kids. You know, these kids don't smile a lot. They're opening their presents, and this is as excited as they get. You saw it right there. And we were talking about, well, what, what's the response? They said, everybody's like that over there. They're living in war every day. They don't know if they're going to live tomorrow. They're very somber. They're appreciative, but they're very somber. Do you think if we talked about suffering to them the way we talk about suffering? No offense, Michelle, because I had the same week you did, a little bit. But I said, man, we had a rough week. What happened to you? Man, my wife went in the hospital. I didn't get any sleep. We, we've got two people that are facing death, and really, that's all you had happen to you? I lost my mom and dad last week, and my brother was shot and killed this week. It, you want to compare notes? Suffering is God's agent to teach us. I know this isn't a popular message, but I want you to hear this. Though, this, though he was the Son of God, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of the eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jonah's thankful because through this suffering, God has changed his heart. God has changed my heart this week through what my wife has been going through because I've realized that she sacrifices a whole lot to share me. You know who she wanted to pick up today? Now, Michelle's doing it, but she sacrifices that. She sacrifices her Friday night. She sacrifices me during the week. She sacrifices. I eat lunch with some of you and your females, and she shared this with me a couple months ago. How would you feel if I was having lunch counseling a man every other day? Huh. Yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> and what God's doing is, through my suffering, he's teaching me about who? Me. Because the problem isn't my wife. The problem is who? It's me. And Jonah's thankful for this. He's filled with joy and peace, even though it's dark and hot. He's asked God for forgiveness, and God has forgiven him. And listen, no matter where you are and no matter what you're going through, God is with you. You may feel abandoned, but God may actually have brought this into your life. The heck you say, Pastor, he may have. To teach you something about you. How many of y'all have ever blown it in a big way? If I had my deacons come forward. Yesterday... God taught me a little lesson. He's been teaching me a lot. I think he's been teaching me for a while. I'm just listening more. I left here from Barbara's funeral service, memorial service, and uh, God really blessed that. If you were here, was that not a blessing? The family just really got that together well, and um, it really ministered to me and others. And uh, I had my pink shirt on and my blue pants, and I've lost weight, so I'm looking good. <laughs> and I'm going to go in the hospital to kind of impress my wife and love on her, and I want to look really good. So I didn't need anything, because when I eat stuff, I just drip. It hits me. And so I'm sitting there, and Mia's on my lap. I'm dressed all nice. I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. And for no reason, Mia's never done this. She's on my lap and talking, and she went, <coughs> oh. Now, Mia got something that Nikki and Michelle have grown up with for years, but this was the first day Mia got it. It's called Daddy Eyes. I didn't say anything. I didn't go off. I gave her daddy eyes, and she did this. And she started sobbing and put her face in my shirt, and she just started sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. She wouldn't stop. And I was rubbing her back and said, sweetie, it is okay. Sweetie, it's okay. And I go to pick her up to talk to her about it, and she goes crying again. When she got up, she'd been eating barbecue chips and... <laughs> Nice big wet stain. It was just, it was beautiful. And then Beth, who's had no visitors, the whole time we've been there, 
It was visitor day. Everybody and their brother was coming yesterday. It was like a revolving door, and I'm thinking, Hello. why do I share that story? Because in reality, we walk around blind to the mess that we are. Amen. We think we look good. We think we look pretty. But the truth is, we've got barbecue chips and soiled shirt all over the place. And God sometimes will come into our life to just to remind us we're broken. He'll come to remind us you can't do everything yourself. You're, you're like a child. You need my help to do this. And God loves us so much that he sent his son not just to die for us, but to suffer so we can learn from his suffering. There's a teaching in Christianity today that says we're not even supposed to suffer. That's not biblical. Because we live in a fallen world, and the Bible even says all those who desire to live holy will, will, will suffer. Because the world will be against us, our adversary will be against us. But we have a God who loves us so much that instead of putting us in the whale, when Jesus said, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah, I'm going to be in the earth for three days. And I'm going to raise up from the dead. So that everything, listen, this is wonderful if you'll get a hold of it. So that everything that you're suffering through, it won't be as bad as what you should have. And I'm going to catch every, this is what Psalms say, I'm going to catch every tear you cry in a bottle. I'm going to remember everything that you suffered for in my name. And when you step off into eternity, you're going to enter into my rest. And for eternity, all those things, I'm going to wipe away your tears will be exactly the way they're supposed to be. Will they be suffering in heaven? No. How long do we get to enjoy that? Forever and ever and ever. That's why Paul said, the sufferings that I go through now, compared to the glories that will be, this pales in comparison. Amen? So whatever you're going through, remember that God loves you so much that he died that you could have eternal life and to enter into his rest. And my deacon stand. You know, the Bible says that uh, those that take of the Lord's Supper in an improper way will suffer discipline from the Lord. Did you know that? That's why sometimes you'll see somebody, they won't take it because they know there's something in their life that they just haven't dealt with. Or Why would God do that? because our selfishness and our sinfulness and the things that we oftentimes think is funny that bring suffering to other people brought suffering to him. And by his stripes, his whippings, we're healed. By his death, we're saved. And so when we take this, we're not to take it lightly. We're to take it and remember and examine ourselves. And here's the key word, we're to examine Ourself. It's so easy to examine Judy Strickland and Mary Clay. I can examine you and you. It's a lot harder for us to go, God, what is broken in me? And so oftentimes God will bring things into our life that push those things up. Could it be this week was so bad because we live in a sinful world? Yeah. Could it be this week was so bad because we have an adversary that runs around like a lion seeking to destroy? Oh, yeah. Could it be so bad that God may have sent a wind and a wail into our life to help us see something? Yeah. And so as we go to take this, let's, let's pray to him. God, we forget that if we are to be followers of Christ, we too will suffer. Father, there were some disciples that did incredible things and they suffered little. And then there were some that lived very short lives that suffered much. And a lot of that has to do with our fallen world and the sinfulness of this world and the corruption of this world. But Father, we forget that like Peter and Paul, your son Christ, those sufferings brought about a fruit in their life. Help us to be fruitful, Father. Help us to see what our idols are. Help us to confess to you that our souls can be restored. And Father, if we are in our sin and have not confessed you as Lord, I pray we would do that. 
Just be with us, Father. Teach us, lead us, and convict us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. As y'all are taking that cup, y'all have told me I've lost a lot of weight. You notice my collar's kind of funny this morning because my neck's gone. Um, I've lost more muscle than fat, though. And let me tell you, that's, that doesn't mean much to y'all. It devastates me. But let me tell you how God uses suffering. Uh, how do you know that, Larry? I've been measuring. I don't weigh anymore. I measure. I've lost three inches on my arms. I've lost three inches on my legs. I've lost an inch on my neck. That's not all fat. And God has used that because when the doctor gave me clearance and said, you can go back to the gym, I went back to the gym and I started to build my muscle and I wanted to get back to what I used to be. And in three weeks, it's gone. Whew. September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. Whew. All that work is gone. And I was stewing, and I don't know if you talk to God like a friend, but I do, and I was stewing, and God kind of laid this heart on me. Do you work on your soul as hard as you work on your body, Larry? Are you watching what you're taking into your soul as much as you're watching what you're eating? Do you make commitment for time for the gym every night? Do you make commitment for time with me every day? Now, he didn't do that to shame me. He's trying to show me I've got some, maybe some idols in my life. And it convicted me. Do you think God let some of that suffering happen so he could talk to me and teach me? Yeah. The same is true with what Christ did for us. This cup you're about to take is a reminder. It's to symbolize the blood. And this is what God is saying. Do you want to see how serious what you're doing is? This is what it cost me. And I loved you so much that I sent my son into the world to die for you and to shed his blood so your sins can be forgiven so that we can have a relationship. I didn't send my son into the world to condemn you and judge you and shame you. I sent him into the world to save you. And all I ask of you is that you will love others the way that I have loved you. The Bible says, love will cover a multitude of sins. Do we cover a multitude of those who sin against us or we take them to task? Do we hold a grudge and get angry and talk under our breath about people or do we lay down our life for them? Because what God has called us to do, just like Jonah has been called to do, is to lay down our life for those who don't know Christ. That we can have them share. That we can have them share in the goodness of God's love and this forgiveness the way we have. We can share it with others. And so this week as we uh, think about what we've talked about in church today and as you take this cup, do you love your enemy enough to take a bullet for them? Do you love that person that hurts you enough to take a bullet for them? Or do you just want to talk bad about them around town? That's where Jonah was. And if we're honest, is that where we are? Raise your hand if that's where you are sometimes. God wants more. And so let's pray. Father, forgive us for the things that we watch and take into our soul. Father, forgive us for the things that we say and do. Father, forgive us for blaming people for things that are our fault. And God, thank you that like Jonah, your love does not let us go. You didn't give up on Jonah and you don't give up on us. Your mercies are new every morning and you're faithful when we're faithless, and your love will never fail. Thank you for loving us despite ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said.